Hi everyone, this is Peter, and I want to talk a little bit uh, about a very interesting development in European art that emerges uh, coming into the, especially the beginning of the 16th century, so the 1500s, north of the Alps. And this is basically the development of what we call landscape painting in its own right. Um, this is a, a kind of, it's a, it's a tricky subject to discuss because for starters, we need to define what landscape is and what that means. Um, and then think a little bit about how it emerges um, concurrently with developments uh, in other kinds of subject matter, particularly what we might describe as more secular uh, subjects, uh, genre painting, still life, portraiture, and so on. So we're going to start uh, looking at an important sort of progenitor of landscape painting. And that is um, an individual named Joachim Hattner. Um, this is a uh, this is a really formative character. He's a really formative character in the early development of independent landscape painting. And this piece is uh, in the Prado in, in Madrid, in Spain, is a great example of the kind of uh, art that a landscape painter might make uh, again in the initial decades or so of the 16th century. Um, what Patner has done here is given us um, an image that is kind of two images simultaneously, uh, namely uh, an image with religious overtones with the figure of uh, St. Jerome in the foreground, and also in a real sense uh, kind of um, larger, what's often going to be described as a cosmic or world landscape view with a much, much broader range and a you know, variety of situations. Looking at a few um, other aspects overall with regard to this piece, uh, it's easy to see that its size is relatively small, which is to say that it is intended most likely for private uh, purchasing display uh, within a relatively modest house, uh, not in the context of a large um, you know, church or chapel or a more aristocratic uh, palace or some similar larger uh, structure. So it's intended to be um, purchased by uh, an individual who wishes to keep it, um, you know, uh, in, in kind of close proximity to everyday life. This gives rise to a number of uh, interesting questions, not least of which is just how much do the religious content in this piece matter? In other words, was it a in essence, a devotional piece, um, or were there other aspects uh, which patrons might have found particularly pleasing or interesting? And I suggest that this piece contains a little bit of both. It fits within a kind of um, situation or set of circumstances uh, having to do with a burgeoning uh, middle-class art market where painters could sell uh, directly to patrons or to dealers, um, works that have been, in essence, created um, with a view toward, um, you know, purchasing because they kind of, the purchaser just kind of felt like it, um, not drawing up elaborate contracts in advance or worrying excessively about, um, you know, meeting a particular patron's needs. Um, Instead, what's more likely is the artist would assemble with you know, more or less degrees of sophistication components of, um, you know, whether it's the view of nature or the anecdotal details about St. Jerome, um, would put these things together in such a fashion that, um, you know, literally somebody coming into the workshop or somebody coming into uh, an art dealer shop or if this is transported to an art fair. Um, basically, my buy it on the spot. Um, we have ample evidence of uh, increasingly large um, art markets seen in Europe in significant centers like, you know, Antwerp, uh, Brussels, etc., facilitating the exchange of money and visual art. And it's worth pointing out that these types of pictures found their way to uh, Italy as well, and um, definitely influenced the outlooks of artists and patrons on the other side of the Alps. So what is um, the St. Jerome uh, really about? Let's go down and just see a little bit. 
there's some annotations I've thrown in there for you all to kind of, you know, to consider. Basically, what we're seeing, as I said, is a kind of composite landscape incorporating a number of important features. Um, in the foreground, we can see the uh, ostensible religious content, namely St. Jerome, the famous translator of uh, the Bible, the Hebrew and Christian Bible, into Latin. Um, here he's uh, depicted in rural retreat, and we have letters of his that outline you know, his attempt to basically get away from the decadence of the Roman Empire, um, which is in its last, you know, last years, decades, really, at this, at this point, um, and where he would pray to uh, Christ and just generally exercise his kind of religious devotional um, activities. So he's in this very rustic sort of hut. Um, he has a crucifix and a skull. Um, this is a kind of iconography that's developing at this point in time. It's also quite popular in Venice. He is accompanied uh, in this scene by a lion. And in fact, Jerome is pulling a paw, sorry, thorn from the paw of the lion, and thereby earning the lion's uh, friendship. He's, uh, the lion then becomes a kind of constant companion to Jerome in many representations. It's also interesting to note that this representation of Jerome uh, doesn't show him as a cardinal in a brilliant red costume, which is also very typical uh, for this um, for this subject. Um, so there's this sense in the foreground, and there are other um, aspects of the lion legend, for instance, off to the side right here, um, where the artist is kind of zoomed in up close on this proximal, you know, kind of anecdote, this little vignette right here. Um, you can see in the foreground that the artist has set up a kind of scheme for us to travel more easily into the middle and far distance of the picture. So, for instance, we see uh, a couple of devices, one or two um, passageways, one leading through this somewhat fantastic rock pinnacle, this tunnel, this sort of dark light. And we see another uh, road moving through here with, you know, what appears it could be pilgrims. That's a popular um, sort of motif. Oftentimes, these types of you know, people are described as staffage in discussion of, of landscape art. So um, the eye can move easily through this initial sort of barrier and of rocks and trees. And this path, for instance, is quite interesting to see it lead up uh, as it circles around this sort of immense prominence right here to a somewhat unlikely church uh, that's present uh, in the um, uh, in the middle distance of the piece. And the church, uh, it's pretty clear this is very common in uh, sort of interpretations of these types of landscapes, represents by its height and relative inaccessibility a kind of uh, spiritual ascent of the soul uh, moving towards God. And the division that's marked by that prominent outcropping between this sort of city of God, to borrow Augustine's phrase, and the city of man in a lower and more sort of prosaic location, I think it's, it's probably deliberate. Um, and it is uh, this type of formulation in landscape is seen in other contexts as well. And so it's probably not too far-fetched to think of it in that terms of uh, this piece. But that said, one of the great problems when analyzing landscape painting is discerning precisely what could be interpreted as merely naturalistic detail, um, however imaginary, uh, for instance, with these jutting rocks right here, um, and which is more allegorical or symbolic in nature. So that's a, you know, that's a, that's a piece constantly to keep in mind. Um, as we move out into the middle distance, you can see another feature that's typical of this, in a sense, formula for landscape art that emerges in the 16th century, and that is relatively warm uh, earth tones of brown, reddish brown, yellow in the foreground that begin to become much more cool, uh, trending much more heavily toward green, and um, then eventually, as we move out to this sort of estuary, the kind of harbor and river and then the open ocean uh, becomes incredibly uh, uh, you know, brilliantly blue. Uh, this is a very common uh, construction in the so-called world landscape tradition to move from warm to cooler. And then finally, as you can see in the far distance, uh, just basically uh, a very, very light shade I should say, tint of, of blue. Um, atmospheric perspective 
of this type is you know essential in terms of moving the eye easily across vast implied distances. And Patnier was a master, as were most of his followers, in terms of you know, setting up that uh, kind of um, you know guiding the eye through space. Another device that's used is, as you can see, it's going to be kind of a visual landmark. So, for example, again, relatively detailed and local color, warmer outcropping right here than a much cooler and less defined uh, sort of fantastic crop outcropping right here and then smaller and even more so <clears throat> uh, bluer outcrops uh, moving the eye readily through uh, from foreground to middle ground uh, the background the outcroppings themselves are interesting because of course they um, don't necessarily reflect the average experience of someone living and moving through the low countries. Um, that said, there are local outcrops and cliffs um, not so distant from where um, Patnier might have lived and worked that may have provided that artist with um, you know, the kind of raw material he needed to make a landscape that is more visually interesting and, and more dynamic. So if we look at Patnier's piece, and, and again, the, the sort of formula becomes incredibly influential through the 16th century, and, you know, is followed again, copied by many, many um, artists seeking to emulate and take advantage of the market for such pictures. We can see a, a kind of masterly synthesis of all of these uh, elements combined with a small amount of narrative, some of it more prominent and straightforward to understand, such as Jerome removing the thorn, or uh, relatively obscure elements consigned, sort of reunion of Jerome's donkey and uh, Jerome's lion. Uh, this is all um, material obtained from the, from the famous Golden Legend. Um, let's look at a couple details before we close out for today. So you can see as we tighten uh, in just a little bit more here, the kinds of you know, very close and tightly worked, precise uh, elements in the picture that especially for somebody who's living with this in a domestic setting, might have found fascinating to literally travel through. And if, for instance, if this was in the house of, say, a merchant, uh, the home of an individual who may well have traveled extensively himself and kind of vicariously uh, relives those kinds of uh, experiences uh, in this piece. So again, fantastic outcroppings. Um, this type of uh, precise detail continues, of course, into the foreground with the image of the, the patient and um, generous and kind saint uh, in his waddle and dog sort of rustic hut. You can see what appears to be a Bible closed shut right here. The lion, a crucifix, and um, this sort of memento mori piece, which is which is very typical um, in representations of the saint. Um, for next, for the next talk, I'll go into a kind of development of this uh, theme, especially in the work of Peter Bruegel, the Elder, where he takes this, many of the same ingredients, but uh, reworks them in a much more secular fashion.